Good morning, and thank you very much. I'd like to start with apologizing for the fact that I've arrived late. My first encounter um, with the Belgians this morning was indeed uh, not the best one I've had in my life. My bag was actually stolen at Central Station here in Brussels. I guess that's the Belgians' revenge for everything I've done to them in my previous life. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, um, in, the, in the first months after leaving politics, I actually never expected that I would face a whole full of auditors to talk about the lessons learned from the crisis and topical issues in the accountancy debate, because at the time that I left politics, that did not seem to be much of an issue at all. Still, here I am today to talk to you, and it is with great pleasure that I do so. First of all, however, I'd like to mention a few things. Although I have now been working at KPMG for almost a year, I am not an accountant. Uh, I even fear that I may never even become one. Um, so should I say ignorant things today about your profession, as you probably may come to expect from people with a political background, then you will have to be kind and forgive me. In any case, I will do my best to steer clear of your professional field. I'm also not here this morning to bring to you only messages and ideas from KPMG. For that, maybe you should ask somebody else from KPMG. What I would like to do is try to see whether we can build bridges between two worlds that sometimes appear to be facing with their backs to each other. First of all, the world of social opinion and more specifically politics. And secondly, the world of accountancy of which I am now a part as a partner of KPMG. And bringing together those two worlds, I see as a very important task within KPMG and within the broader community of audit professionals. And I would li also like to do this exercise with you today. Neither one of these worlds has the exclusive wisdom in their hands, but both worlds are actually in it together and cannot succeed without taking into account of each other's realities, images, dilemmas, and expectations. And sometimes it rather looks as if a dialogue of the deaf is taking place between them instead of a real dialogue. So today I hope to be able to act as some kind of interpreter so that we can seek a common language. And perhaps the two worlds will never totally agree, but when mutual questions are not even understood, the answers will by definition never be satisfactory. And that causes friction and frustration and no one will benefit from it. Ladies and gentlemen, in 1995, the US political scientist Francis Fukuyama, author of the best-selling The End of History, wrote another book, which was called Trust, The Social Virtues and the Creation of Prosperity, in which he argued that trust does not only form one of the core fabrics of society, but it's also essential for a proper functioning economy. We must be able to trust that the food is safe, that the computer does what the manufacturer claims, and that the brakes of our new car do not fail after only a few weeks. We must be able to be confident that paper banknotes, or in our day and age, the electronic balances on our bank account, do represent the value that they claim to represent. We must be able to trust that the agreements reached between companies and the contracts they sign will hold up. In his book, The Great Disruption, four years later, Fukuyama asserted that this trust was subject to rapid erosion in many ways, causing major social but also economic problems. When trust makes way for suspicion, the seed has been sown for a type of cooperation that only functions through enforcement, sanctions, laws, and controls. Fukuyama thus finds the sore spot that is still as topical 10 years later. In the West, many people have lost their trust and confidence in traditional institutions, such as government, political parties, churches, trade unions, but they've also lost faith in each other, faith in a type of unwritten consensus concerning fundamental values and standards, the bonum commune in classical terms, has made for a society where trust is very easily seen as naive. It is not surprising that this crisis of confidence has also spread to institutions and professions in which public trust plays a major part, for example, banks and insurance companies, but also doctors, 
judges, notaries, public have lost the natural public trust and confidence in them. Increasingly, issues such as expertise and independence are no longer a given, but must be proven and accounted for every time again. Trust has to be demonstrated and earned. Now, I've taken this roundabout way to demonstrate the crisis of confidence that currently appears to be visited upon the accounting, accounting profession has not come out of the blue. There is a social climate in which trust has a fundamentally different meaning. And this means that questions are now also raised about certainties in accountancy that have survived for over a century. And it also means that accountants these days will have to explain, be held accountable, and answer questions pertaining to issues that have not previously been so high on the agenda. All of a sudden, people appear as, as they did in that famous fairy tale saying that the emperor is not wearing any clothes. And that's a shock. And many accountants revert to a defensive reflex or believe that their profession is actually too complicated to explain to the broader public. But much to their surprise, accountants realize that this will not make the questions disappear. That being right and getting your way is not one of the same thing. In fact, that other people will start formulating their own questions that turn their trusted world upside down. A good example of such an eroding certainty is the fact that the object of the independent external auditor is also the client and is paying for it. You're not used to it being any, any different. And I'm convinced that you, as the majority of your colleagues, genuinely believe that you audit the books of the company that will later pay you for the audit in a fully honest, critical, and independent manner. Nevertheless, a problem immediately arises when somebody says, but surely is it not at all possible to perform an independent audit if, if the audited company also pays the bill? What if the result is not the liking of the client? And you may not agree with these questions or even find them out of order, but if the public lose confidence in the fact that an auditor can be independent, despite the fact that the audited company also pays the bill, you have a problem. Another such a sticky dilemma. The Dutch founder of public accountancy, Theodorus Limperg, described the accountant as the trusted person in public matters. With its audit and report, the auditor provides public assurance that a company or organization presents a true and fair view in its financial statements of reality. And as such, the accountant has a public task that is even enshrined in law. Now, to be able to arrive at that opinion, the accountant also has a trusted role with the organization being audited, which is confirmed by signing the confidentiality clause. And without this duty, not a single company will let him in. But this, of course, undeniable, undeniably leads to potential tensions on the line. The system has an intrinsic weakness. How does the public know that the accountant indeed raises the alarm when something goes wrong? Is it not realistic to expect that client pressure on the auditor will be at its most intense when the company faces problems and wants to hide them? I have no doubt whatsoever that the vast majority of accountants will remain astute. However, I do understand this type of public debate. Still, in contributions to that de debate by accountants, I often encounter very defensive reactions which deny upfront that there may be any problem, let alone that a solution is required. And then the dialogue falls silent. It is not enough for accountants to expect public trust they will have to offer greater assurance that they are indeed performing their public duty properly. And this process starts by taking public doubts and questions seriously and to seek together for satisfactory answers. Ladies and gentlemen, skepticism has arisen after the credit crunch about the public trust role of the public auditor. To keep it simple, banks and other financial institutions appear to be in excellent financial health. 
And this was confirmed in the eye of the public by accountants who issued unqualified reports to the financial statements. However, the financial sector collapsed in a few months' time because far too generous mortgages had been furnished to poor Americans. And the risks of this irresponsible mortgage policy found their way to all the financial institutions across the world by means of complicated and obscure constructions. And when the bubble finally burst, it did create a domino effect, with the collapse of Lehman Brothers working as an unparalleled catalyst. The banks only managed to survive by virtue of national governments offering many billions of euros of public funds to save them. So far, my personal version of the credit crunch for dummies. But after the crisis, of course, the serious questions came up. And the first one is, who's to blame? The banks that had become far too entwined with each other? Or the combination of investment banks and commercial banks serving the public? All the incentives in the financial systems leading to irresponsible risks being awarded with royal bonuses and wrong decisions hardly being punished? Or was it slack supervision by regulatory bodies? But what about the accountants who did not raise the alarm when everything pointed towards things going wrong? They ended up in the dock too. Had we not assigned them with the public duty to raise that alarm? Accountants' reaction to this criticism was to emphasize that they had acted in compliance with laws and regulations, that the credit crisis was not a crisis of auditors. Now that was and remains an inappropriate reaction to an, un an entirely understandable public concern, because that answer leaves only two alternatives. Either the audit serves no purpose at all, so why continue to place it in a legal framework, or the existing laws and regulations do not produce the desired public outcome, which, in this case, is a prompt signal from an independent institution that a financial institution is taking major risks. So by proving their formal legal point, however understandable from a liability perspective, accountants risk losing their relevance. And that, of course, is the basis for public trust. And then their license to operate will also expire. In my opinion, there has been a short circuit due to a misunderstanding in the accountancy debate that has been going on since the crisis. The search by the public and politicians for the weak links in the financial system that we nowadays refer to as the system risks was experienced by accountants as an attack on their professional integrity. It makes sense that this will lead to a defensive reaction. But then a useful and frank debate gets bogged down before it has even started. And I'm convinced that a healthy, open, and frank debate is possible and essential in the public interest and from a public perspective. What do the public and the market want, then? Assurance. Assurance that the financial information provided by a company is solid, also because an external accountant has had a critical look. And this assurance can be given by an accountant. However, an audit opinion is not an insurance policy against risk that may arise in the future, and they should be crystal clear about it. It's up to a business to provide all the information that is relevant to shareholders and stakeholders, such as staff, financial institutions, the government, and only then does the, government, does the accountant enter the scene. So first, the public and the market, in other words, all of us, have to decide what information we exactly need and what degree of assurance that requires. For example, in the field of risk management, the quality of the managers or the sustainability performance. And this implies, but certainly in this order of events, the request to the accountant to check and verify this information. Now, this will not always be possible in the manner that we're used to form the financial statements. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it, according to the well-known top US entrepreneur, Jack Welch. And the same applies to accountants. If you can't measure it, it's very hard to audit it. Without a legal framework and a proper framework of standards, the auditor cannot perform the work. So such a framework is necessary for increasing the relevance of the auditor's report. For example, by assessing the quality of an internal control framework and performing a sensitivity analysis. It should always be borne in mind whom the auditor reports his findings to. 
Some companies seem to expect accountants to prepare some sort of alternative financial statements, preferably including information that the company itself does not want to release. This is in contrast to the basic principle that the organization itself is primarily responsible for financial reporting. The publication of the management letter, which the accountant submits to the audit committee and the business, is a deceptive solution. Partly because of the confidentiality clause, the management letter will be reduced to a letter with little substance. But this does not alter the fact that accountants should be given more space to offer their professional judgment on issues going beyond the financial ratios from the past and to make their auditors report more than an empty standard report confirming the financial statements are compliant. Now I'm well aware of the reticence among many accountants to be given greater scope than they have at the moment. Many shareholders' interest in the accountant usually increases exponentially when something has gone wrong and the accountant emerges as the potential party to be held liable. We therefore cannot redefine the role of the accountant without also taking a realistic look at liability risks. Now here too, the auditor's report cannot serve as an insurance policy. The assurance offered by an accountant cannot imply that the accountant assumes liability for what is by definition an uncertain future. Public confidence that accountants do their job properly does not go hand in hand with the insurance they provide with respect to financial and other reporting. That trust is inseparable from the perception of the quality of accountants' work. Accountants often explain quality to too one-dimensionally in terms of technical quality. The public, on the other hand, usually understands quality as professional attitude, that the accountant is professional, critical, independent, is not influenced by a hidden commercial agenda, and will remain judicious should a company apply pressure. Accountants will have to find a better balance in their external communications between professional quality and what I will conveniently call public and social quality. When this is not managed properly, the public and market will be less and less ready to simply accept trust in the quality of accountants and will want it still further enforced. And that leads to the threat of making organized distrust a legal issue. And this will not serve anyone or make anyone happier. Above all, it will not bring back trust. If a parent only has a huge stick as an educational tool, the child will never develop the confidence to make personal choices and take personal responsibility. Now, besides investments in professional and technical quality, I could also see steps being taken in other areas to further guarantee quality, independence, and the correct professional attitude. This was achieved in the Netherlands by, among other things, broadening the dialogue between the prudential regulator and the accountants of the financial institutions and making it a real two-way dialogue. In addition, proposals are on the table now to give supervisory directors a much more emphatic role in directing the accountant, which is also a good development. In the context of the checks and balances that characterize modern corporate governance, the external accountant must primarily serve the supervisory role of the supervisory directors, in particular the audit committee. It is, in my opinion, also up to the supervisory directors to keep an eye on issues such as the quality of the audit, the relationship between audit and advisory work, the possible advantages of issuing a new tender for the audit, obtaining information about the opinion of regulatory bodies of accounting organizations, etc. And that, by the way, also implies focusing on the quality and the attitude of the supervisory directors themselves. There are some concerns here about this among Dutch supervisory directors, particularly at medium-sized and small enterprises. <coughs> Moreover, I would applaud a much more lively debate during the general meeting of shareholders about the quality and the design of the audit. It is a wonderful paradox that shareholders are also demanding a broader role for the accountant, but those same shareholders enthusiastically applaud when the audit fee is reduced. And then, of course, the broad quality debate risks to lose its quality soon. 
Now, the question is whether all of this is enough. Far-reaching ideas about fundamental changes to the current system are doing the rounds in politics, not least here in Brussels. Joint audits, mandatory firm rotation, segregation of audits and advisory, splitting up the big four. Today, these are familiar proposals that cause a shockwave in the accounting community. I think that justified concerns are being raised regarding several of these proposals. It's not clear by a long stretch exactly which problems will be resolved by the ideas floating all over the place. And apart from that, some of the pro proposals actually appear more of a threat to than an improvement of the quality of the profession. For instance, I can very well imagine that it could be healthy for a business to change auditor from time to time. That will ensure a fresh look at things and prevent an all too familiar relationship between the business and the auditor. The only question is whether you're not risking defeating the objective with mandatory firm rotation as is currently suggested. At the moment we see that changing the accountant often puts pressure on the fee, while everyone knows that a lot has to be invested precisely when starting a new audit relationship in order to get to know the business. And this then leaves you facing contrasting incentives that rather affect the quality of the audit negatively than positively. And in addition, maybe a legally enforceable rotation period may not suit an individual company because, for example, it may be busy with a merger or be under severe market pressure. And in that case, a new auditor may just be the trigger in the wrong direction. But the real question is whether accountants are the best placed parties to raise these concerns about mandatory firm rotation. Why would they? Regular rotation opens up the market and offers fresh opportunities to work with new clients. It will cause some anxiety in the beginning, but eventually it will offer every accountant a fair chance to present themselves to a potential client. There are good reasons for not wanting mandatory firm rotation. However, by assuming the role of advocate for their own cause, accountants are running the risk that others may suspect a hidden agenda for holding off firm rotation. In politics, certainly, people not only look at the message, but also at the messenger. And this example also reveals another weakness in the way that many accounting firms have thus far conducted the debate. It's no big deal to shoot down every proposal calling for change in how accountants do their work by listing more disadvantages than advantages. Prices are increasing, the client faces more effort, quality deteriorates, etc. But the question posed far too seldom by accountants themselves so far is whether the relevant proposal, despite all these disadvantages, cannot also contribute to regaining public confidence in the auditor's report. And that is really what it should all be about. And seen in that context, the identified disadvantages may very well appear not to be such a big obstacle. Now, in doing this, we, of course, have to be very careful. Nobody benefits from experiments with uncertain outcomes, certainly not in these times. We must also not lose sight of the task of identifying and reducing system risks and not overreact with solutions for sectors where there are no problems. This leads to unnecessary cost increases without any public benefit. However, accountants cannot stay on the sideline. They too will have to identify, identify their own lessons learned. What can contributions they can make towards reducing existing system risks and what they are doing to regain public confidence. And we don't really know that much about large economic crises because thankfully there have not been that many. What we do know, however, is that the next crisis is always bigger than the last. And that is why it's not feasible for accountants not to play their part in preventing a next crisis, simply because they believe that the crisis was not their crisis. We must keep that debate alive, also in the right quarters. Although as a former politician, I very well understand the inclination of national politicians to personally take the wheel, also as a sign of decisive action towards their own constituents, I would like to warn against a fragmented debate 
concerning the role of accountancy. We are living in a global economy with global players, global markets. It demands a global view and where necessary global standards and global measures. In recent years, a lot has been invested in harmonizing international rules for financial reporting and controls, and that creates better comparability between markets and, as such, greater transparency. And it would lead to an enormous loss of capital if all this work is destroyed by individual countries reverting back to drawing up their own. If there's one lesson from the credit crisis, then it is that global economies are inextricably interwoven. But we have to keep up the pace. The aim to reach European and preferably still international agreements must not be allowed to slow things down. I'm therefore glad that the European Commission in the person of Michel Barnier is taking an active lead in the current debate. Ladies and gentlemen, the debate over the role of, on, on the role of accountants following the credit crisis has gained a new topical impulse in recent months in view of the developments in Greece. The current situation also clearly shows how unruly and stubborn the reality can sometimes be. Hence, a few observations. It is evident that the Greek crisis poses enormous financial risks, not only for international and domestic authorities who are forced to lend billions to Greece in order to stem the crisis. Financial institutions too, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, have major interests in the balance directly through their investments in Greek government's bond, government bonds and indirectly because they may face problems should a Greek crisis befall other countries, such as Spain and Portugal, or foreign financial institutions, such as French and German banks. Now, nobody knows what the final outcome would be, but it's clear that the domino blocks are once again more dangerously close to each other. When one block falls, we can only wait and see where the row of falling dominoes will end. A potential second credit crisis may then be in the making. Now, the crucial question I want to pose today is what the role of accountants should be in this run-up to a potentially serious new financial crisis. How can accountants guard against accusations later, again, that they merely acted as silent observers and did not raise the alarm far more actively? According to some observers, this is a different crisis from the credit crisis. For instance, we can see it approaching far earlier. And moreover, there is now ongoing serious contact between regulators, financial institutions and accountants, partly as an outcome of the lessons learned from the previous crisis. But I can assure you that most, if not all, financial institutions will produce proper financial reports including the unqualified auditor's report issued by the auditor. And that's simply because current laws and regulations leave the accountant with no choice. And if the bubble then nevertheless bursts, accountants will yet again claim that they had acted in line with the applicable laws and regulations, and confidence in the very same accountants will once again suffer great damage. Now, it is, of course, possible to do it differently. Accountants could force financial institutions to take their loss on the Greek government bonds they have in-house, which will totally reflect the spirit of fair value accounting. Accountants could insist on forming substantial provisions, also for the case that the Greek crisis has a far greater impact than in Greece alone. Accountants can draw up risk scenarios. Accountants could issue qualified reports conditional upon market developments in Greece. In a nutshell, Accountants can do what some critics claim they had failed to do in the run-up to and during the credit crisis, raise the alarm and anticipate approaching doom. But then again, the impact would be enormous, because even before we know the outcome of the Greek crisis, the balance sheets of all the European and other financial institutions will show major shifts extra equity would probably have to be attracted in order to strengthen the sea defences and there would be a good chance of major unrest resulting on financial markets among the public and authorities. And the very critics who blame accountants for a lack in decisiveness would then be able to accuse accountants of playing to the gallery. It looks therefore as if accountants can never win and perhaps that may even be true especially in these uncertain times. 
precisely because a period of crisis or near crisis is not really ideal for experimenting. However, that should not stop us from considering fundamentally new choices of how we can strengthen confidence in the regulation of and the supervision on financial institutions. Let me just leave you with one thought on this topic. As a finance minister, I have in recent years been closely involved at the core of financial regulation and supervision. I've had to bail out banks and I've had to let banks go bankrupt. And I've gradually come to the conclusion that the basic premise underpinning our system of financial regulation and supervision is no longer viable. This premise goes as follows. No news is good news, and when news does reach you, it's too late, because then it's already gone wrong. Now, in a post-WikiLeaks era, that philosophy is untenable. The financial sector is one of the few sectors in society where trust and regulation is still largely based on secrecy. And that will turn out to be unsustainable. We are irrevocably moving towards a system of greater transparency on the basis of assessment ratios in the public domain with lenders and others also knowing in advance when exactly a regulator will take action and how it will take action. And this therefore also offers an incentive not to let things get that far. And this is, of course, a responsibility they will only accept if they know that taxpayers are not prepared to bail them out. In other words, a new system of financial regulation and supervision containing elements that are familiar to us from the North American practice in the field of prompt corrective action and fitting in with modern insolvency laws for financial institutions. That is the real fundamental change that will have to contribute to confidence and trust in financial institutions and in every entity seen as regulating these institutions. Ladies and gentlemen, truth is in the eye of the beholder. Public trust in the role and the functioning of accountants is vital, also when inaccurate presentations and unrealistic expectations affect this trust. Therefore, I would like to plead, be good and tell it. Invest in quality and innovation. Allow young people the space to develop into solid professionals. Spread the message that the goal to deliver the best possible professional quality is not an obstacle to commercial success, but precisely an absolute condition. And especially, get involved in that public debate. Spread the word. Transparency is an essential asset of our modern day culture. Accountants are in a unique position to assist other organizations in achieving transparency by providing access to relevant and reliable information. Accountants will personally also have to show what they do, how they do it, and what dilemmas they encounter, and how they contribute towards our shared goal, transparent, efficient, and reliable markets. Within KPMG, but also outside KPMG, I'd like to assist on that mission because I believe in the work and the talent and the drive of colleagues that I work with every day. And because I believe that accountants fulfill a vital role in the economic system. And of course, because I believe that accountants can contribute towards giving trust a new lease of life in our society, and again, making it a concept that binds us together. Regaining the public trust will build bridges to a brighter future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Boss, for this uh, very interesting speech. You actually have addressed uh, all the main issues related to the role of the auditor and the expectation uh, the stakeholders do have. Uh, despite of this uh, relatively difficult morning, you have kindly accepted to give the floor to the audience to raise some questions. Thus, before uh, leaving the stage for the panel, uh, I will give uh, the floor to the audience. There are walking microphone, and the first question is from uh, David Devlin. Please, David. Uh. Thank you very much, Andre. Congratulations on a simply fantastic tour de force, from my point of view, to hear um, what I think is a fairly serious and very carefully considered challenge to how we handle the current debate is very encouraging, uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, I think you correctly, apropos Greece, emphasize that this is not at all a theoretical debate. 
uh, and um, I agree with you in what you said. Uh, secondly, your point about being defensive, I would, I'm quite surprised at the current debate, at the, given where the Green Paper started on the role of audit, um, I'm quite surprised at how it has developed into a debate centered on solutions to a perceived problem with market structure, much of which I consider to be perhaps worthwhile from an outsider's point of view, but compared to the challenge of organizing to change the role of audit, uh, to strengthen corporate governance in Europe and elsewhere, and to coordinate on a global basis so that the debate on the role of audit and on auditor communications and the responsibilities develops in a useful way across the globe, that seems to have, in Europe at any rate, fallen into a poor second place. And I contrast it with, for example, what I see in the PAC. We have a very interesting series of papers, the first of which is on the role of audit and audit communications. I think of the recent PCAOB release, concept release, which raises some very interesting questions. And the IAASB role on uh, uh, suggestions around audit reporting. So the question is, I want to put the market structure stuff to one side because I think it would spoil um, what you've said to us because we need to reflect a bit more on how we can help. How would you suggest that we give more emphasis in this debate to developing seriously uh, the role of audit and audit communications and speaking to your points about transparency and I think you also correctly referred to the need to strengthen corporate governance around Europe, which amazingly to me, the European Commission's various green papers on corporate governance have not addressed at all. Any suggestions for how we can give more weight to this aspect of the debate? And congratulations again. Um, well, you know, it, it was said by um, the previous speaker as well. It, it, I guess it all starts with a different mindset. Um, and the mindset should be that this debate is not threatening to the audit profession, but offers lots of opportunities to the audit profession. And that even if it doesn't, it is essential for the license to operate of auditors that they are seen to uh, participate constructively in this debate. And, and if that mindset is not there, if, if the mindset is all about how to avoid losing market share, um, then, then, then you won't get anywhere. Um, the second thing that, that is very important, I believe, is to genuinely understand that uh, politicians have, have a point. <laughs> um, you know, not, they do not always have a point, but, but I think they do have a point here. You know, they are right now defending uh, austerity policies that their countries haven't seen for, for, for decades vis-a-vis -vis their constituencies, you know, subsidies being built down, taxes being raised, unemployment rising. They're defending all that because in one sector of our economy where traditionally the government was kept at a large distance because they said, we can do it with ourselves, we've got good supervision, we've got good professional integrity, everything is right about the system and the incentives, right in that sector things went wrong, a whole economy suffered and things have now got to be put back on track. So politicians are not happy people at the moment. You know, they're having to conduct very difficult debates with, with their constituents. And um, um, they will, of course, always have, have, a, have a tendency to then look for scapegoats as to, as to who, who, who's to blame and, and, and then look for the easy ways to deal with that by, by in, um, initiating new laws and new regulations, you know, as if that would solve the problem. But at least it has a symbolic value as... as because it suggests that they are actually trying to do something about the problem and that they're not only acting vis-a-vis -vis innocent citizens but also vis-a-vis -vis the people who've caused the crisis. Now, if, if you want that process to be controlled and, and to be proportional, um, it's, it's not right just to sit and wait, let alone be defensive, because then uh, it will probably only get worse, the type of initiatives that will be, will be dropped on the, on the audit um, uh, community. So, so I think that, um, um, and, and this is, I guess, what disturbed me most, um, the initial response from the audit community on uh, Michel Barnier's proposals was, um, we've done nothing wrong, we did everything according to laws and regulations. About 99% of the financial sector community did everything according to laws and regulations, and we still have this crisis that ordinary people are now paying for. So that just doesn't work. 
um, we have to generally accept that there is a point here, that there is reason for concern, for discontent, maybe even for anger, and, and with you know, an appropriate amount of humility, <laughs> try to establish a new position in that, uh, in that discussion. And then I guess the third thing would be um, that with any of the proposals that Michel Barnier puts on the table or that national governments put on the table or parliamentarians, it would be good if audit auditors and auditing firms would not only judge um, those proposals on the basis of what it does to their relationship with the client, but that they would add a new criterion, and that criterion would be what it does to their relationship with the general public whether it does, re, you know, does make it easier to re-establish re trust. I think if, if that can be done, uh, the, the debate will probably be a lot more fruitful and auditors can be actually more in control and maybe even discover new business opportunities on the way. Okay. Uh, another question, the last one for the benefit of time. Uh, Robert? Uh, thank you, Robert Hodgkinson, ICAW. Um, you, you talked about the linkage between the accountancy profession and politicians, and you talked about the um, uh, perhaps impending uh, crisis for uh, private sector auditing of the, um, of the Greek debt crisis. You didn't actually explicitly refer perhaps to the origins of that crisis and the perhaps uh, rather direct uh, relations that might be between the accounting profession and governments and politicians to say you need to be more transparent and do better public sector financial reporting and that would have uh, helped address the root causes of the crisis. Anything on that other issue because we've focus very much on, uh, following Stephen, on private uh, equity markets rather than public debt markets. Is there a huge opportunity there to really uh, challenge uh, the uh, po politicians and governments and make them better and really show the public that we're on their side? There's certainly a lot of things that politicians have done wrong in, in uh, maybe during the crisis and certainly in, in, in the phase before the crisis. Um, and one of them was probably um, allowing countries into, into the Eurozone that economically were not up to it. Um, a second is probably uh, relaxing some of the key criteria in the Eurozone uh, for uh, some of the uh, larger membership countries that then had a spin-off towards other countries uh, with lots, uh, much less healthy state of finance uh, thereafter. Um, whether the transparency of public finance really is the issue here, let me say two things about that. Um, the first is, of course, that if, if you look at Greece, uh, that hardly was a problem of transparency. I mean, that was clear fraud, which, which, is, even, which is even worse, uh, but which at the moment seems to be restricted to the Greek case and, and you know, not, not being a broader thing in Europe. What is a broader issue in, uh, in Europe um, is the fact that uh, there is very little um, um, independent uh, supervision on um, uh, public, uh, public accounts. For example, in, in the Netherlands, I think for six or seven years in a row, uh, we have uh, abstained or voted against uh, discharging the European Commissioner uh, when he wanted to be discharged of, of uh, the accounts of, uh, of the European budget. Basically because um, uh, in Europe, I, I think now for 13 or 14 years in a row, there's not uh, an approving uh, a sta a statement that they exactly know what they spend their money on. And, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a terrible statement to your own people if you raise European budgets and if you raise taxes that we cannot be held accountable for exactly where it goes um, in, uh, in Europe. Um, I, I must say, I'm afraid, that uh, the Netherlands, with, I believe, Finland and uh, increasingly the United Kingdom, has more or less stood alone uh, in that discussion. Uh, and that even large countries like Germany and France, uh, but certainly also the more southern European countries, have never wanted to uh, strengthen uh, European procedures on um, accounting for the European budget. Um, and that, that's, that's very sad.